Okay. Thanks, Ruth, for getting that started. And I'm going to be very brief, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the genetics. I wish, Gary, I could talk more about the neuro neurobiology, and maybe during the day we'll have a chance to talk more about that. I'm going to emphasize the genetics, though. Uh, the, the autism is, as Ruth described, a disorder. I'm a lumper rather than a splitter, so I, easier for me to think about two uh, aspects of aloneness and sameness. There are many, many other descriptors in the literature, absence of a theory of mind, um, inability to empathize with other people, all part of the aloneness, living in a bubble as Kanner described. Um, but the, the basic thing is it's one of the core aspects of our humanity. What attracted me to this study of autism is the, it's, it's uh, essential aspect of understanding the minds of other people, not being able to understand people's intentions, not knowing when someone is happy or sad or angry or fearful. It's a tremendous disability and it gets, strikes at the core of what makes us human, what makes us love each other. And the sameness, preservation of sameness is also terribly disabling. It's manifest in uh, repetitive behaviors. You've, many of you have seen autistic children just performing the same act over and over again, turning round and round in circles, shaking their heads, shaking their hands. It's almost but more severe than a compulsive movement disorder. And it's a focus, not just in actions, but in uh, thinking. It's a focus on small objects, almost a hyperacuity to small objects without seeing the bigger picture and the surround. Now, autism is a spectrum. There are children who are mild. At the upper end, some people call that Asperger's syndrome. Some call it high-end autism. Again, as a lumper, I call it high-end autism. And the notion of savant abilities of Einstein, Mozart, and others is, is wonderful, but it is extremely rare. Most children are just disabled. And uh, at the low end of the spectrum, children are mute. They can't function, don't control uh, normal activities of daily living. And if you have an autistic child and speak with parents of an autistic child, you realize how disabling that is for the individual and for the entire family. And if you can close your eyes for a moment and imagine parents with two, sometimes three autistic children, it becomes a life-determining illness, not just at the end of life, but from either birth or certainly within the first two years of life. So it's a tremendous challenge uh, of our time. The prevalence has increased, as Ruth implied. Years ago, it was thought to be one in a couple of thousand births. Now the latest estimates uh, worldwide are one in 100, one 110. But how did that happen? Is that an environmental influence in the face of the fact that this is probably the most significant genetic disorder in developmental psychiatry? Well, I believe there may be environmental influences, and I think the best way to understand that will be to understand the genetic predispositions, why one individual is sensitive to an environmental influence and another is not. But I think one major factor in contributing to the increased reported prevalence of autism is the ever-expanding definition of the syndrome. When Kanner described it in 43, it was autism. Then it was autism spectrum. Then it was a progressive or pervasive developmental disorder. Then it's pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. And it's, uh, the DSM-4 has not helped. It's been a real drawback to, our, uh, to my mind, to our understanding of the description and the prevalence of autism. Many people uh, feel that the prevalence was just as high 10, 15 years ago. It just wasn't recognized. But now that there are services available and a number of other uh, ways to help parents, their people are coming out of the closet. And stigma, which Ruth is particularly interested in, hopefully is being reduced. These children are no longer called imbeciles, queer, 
schizoid, they are understood to have a disability that needs to be addressed. Now, the different ways to evaluate autism clinically are manyfold. We at the Simons Foundation have organized 13 centers, medical centers across the country to evaluate 3,000 families of a certain type, which I will describe in a minute. And right now, we have to evaluate them clinically. And this is a list, not meant to be uh, digested or memorized, but it's a list of the clinical tests administered to the children, to their parents, to their teachers, in order to characterize this syndrome. And on it is the, uh, the two main ones, are the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule and the Autism Diagnostic Interview. ADOS is administered by trained clinicians. It's about an hour-long observation. And ADIR is an interview administered to parents and teachers. And it, it's interesting, and that takes about two hours. <clears throat> Altogether, there are 6,000 bits of information, and I'm emphasizing that because the clinical evaluation is still not precise. We need biomarkers, as is true in many psychiatric disorders, and that's one of the reasons to hunt so intensely for genetic markers. But these are the best diagnostic instruments we have, and as I said, we are trying to evaluate 12,000 people, 3,000 families. And this is what we want to do. We want to account for the core components and the heterogeneity within the disorder. We really do want to search for new therapeutics. There is nothing on the market now in the, in the, um, in the way of a medicine. There is an applied behavioral therapy, which has some efficacy quite early enough which is transient in its benefit, but it's still the best we have in approaching autism right now. And we would like to prevent, detect it early enough to reverse the signs. And I will end this talk by showing you that despite the genetic origins, this may very well be a reversible disorder. So we take the approach of looking for genes, looking for how these genes act as molecules, trying to understand how those gene actions influence neural circuits, and eventually how neural circuits influence behavior and cognition. And you can see from this program that this is several lifetimes of effort, and it's one of the great efforts, <coughs> I believe, and should be call the attention of the greatest scientists in, uh, in modern neuroscience. And we're going to emphasize gene identification in the next five minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. This is, people have, have approached gene identification by linkage studies, that is studying families in which you can trace one or two generations and link a particular piece of DNA to a syndrome. It's hard to do that in autism because as you will see, as you can guess actually, autistic children often don't marry and have children. So it's hard to find pedigrees of more than one or two generations. GWAS is genome-wide association studies where one collects a huge population of unrelated individuals and tries to find DNA or a gene that correlates throughout the whole population with autism, not, not just looking within a particular family. And in this study, one needs thousands, maybe 10,000 individuals and for my estimation, GWAS studies to date have been inconclusive, despite tens of millions of dollars spent. I'm going to emphasize de novo mutations. You will hear more in the coming years about attempts to sequence whole genomes, run DNA through high-speed sequencers. That will certainly take over the field. And also to look for patterns of gene expression epigenetic modifications, not changes in the structure of the genes, but how the genes are regulated. And then there are various attempts to think about what could be wrong here. Is this a defect in transmission in the connections between nerve cells and synapses? Let's look at genes that regulate synaptic function. And then there's just plain dumb luck of stumbling upon a gene because someone has a hunch 
and some of our best candidates have come from that root. But I'm going to emphasize de novo mutations. These, mu these are mutations that arise in each generation, not because they're inherited from one parent or another, but something has happened in that zygote, either in the sperm or the egg. A mutation has occurred, and it keeps on occurring generation after generation. Not the same one, but a mutational event. These are rare changes, they're rare mutations, but they are, in the jargon of the trade, highly penetrant. That when a mutation like this occurs in connection with autism, the likelihood that the result of that zygote, the child, will be autistic is high, maybe more than 40 to 50 percent. It's almost treated like a dominant mutation. So a rare de novo mutation, a mutation evident in the offspring, but not in either parent, and we insist in our collection, that not in any siblings in the family. This autistic child is a singularity. And without going into details, it really does facilitate the statistics of proof that this mutation is in fact relevant to the autism observed in the proband. Now I want to, uh, here's the one piece of genetics I'd like to go through on how one searches for these de novo mutations. And the, the way, w the way w it has come to be studied since about 2007, and I emphasize that because I want you to realize how quickly this field is moving. Uh, the effort here is to compare Ah, I left on the table. It's not doing much good there. Is to compare an individual diagnosed with autism, let's call that the test DNA, with a control, let's call that the, uh, can't read that, the other DNA. And the goal here is to chop the DNA up into pieces, to label it with a fluorochrome, this one glowing green, to chop the test up into pieces, label it with a different color, and, hide, and plate them on wells, these chips, that may have a million spots on a particular glass slide with the microtechnology that's possible, and to measure the ratio of the reference DNA and the test DNA. And ordinarily, we receive one gene from a mother and one from a father. So everyone should, in theory, have two copies of one gene. But the fact is that's not true. During development, as that zygote divides and grows and the, and the number of cells increases, there are changes, alterations in all of our DNA so that some pieces of DNA are deleted leaving only one copy of the gene, either from the mother or the father. And in some cases, the pieces of DNA are duplicated by mechanisms we, we don't have to go into. So you may have three copies of one gene, or four. And the point is that this happens frequently in our genomes with each generation. So we are not simply a mixture of our mothers and fathers. And it makes what you are different from your neighbor, understandable. There's tremendous heterogeneity in the mixing and, uh, and changes in DNA after fertilization. Now, this is an example from a New England Journal of Medicine paper a couple of years ago, in which uh, the notion of a copy number variant was really driven home in autism. Now, this measures the ratio of the test and the reference DNA. And you can see ordinarily, uh, it's about two copies of each gene. But along here, as we march down the chromosome, and this happens to be chromosome 16, the test DNA has really <coughs> less than the control. <coughs> Approximately one, it measures at about one, one and a half fold. The measurements are not so accurate. And here's another subject who has a surplus of DNA. And this deletion along chromosome 16, 
at the region called 11.2 is to date the most recurrent, the most common lesion seen in uh, idiopathic autism. In our first 1,000 families, we have seen this in uh, 14 cases. So it's a little bit more than 1% of all cases of idiopathic unknown autism. That's really quite remarkable. It's a very robust finding. And we suspect there may be more than 50 similar deletions. Now remember, this is a highly penetrant, individually rare, but altogether, the phenomenon is commoner. So that if we can identify 50 such variations, we feel we will have genetic risk factors for 50% of all idiopathic autism. And when you think of that, one in 100 and 110 births, that's really a huge number of people. Now the, now the challenge will begin is understanding what genes are in this segment that's deleted and how are those genes acting in the nervous system. I want to end, I want to try and act here by telling you that the search is worth it. And here I'm going to turn to a closely related disorder, Rett syndrome, um, where these individuals, Adrian Bird in England, uh, developed a mouse model for Rett syndrome, which as Ruth said, is a disorder of young girls. And I misspoke last night. It, there are some children who have been reported at age 40. Uh, because it depends on, this is a gene that is mutant on the X chromosome. The reason we don't see boys with this syndrome is boys only have one X chromosome, and if they are, inherit that gene, they are never born, they never come to term. But girls may have two X chromosomes, and depending on the mixture of how much is expressed from the affected chromosome and the not, the severity of the disease may vary. Uh, that's a hopeful sign, but it's still a severe disorder characterized by mental retardation, actually a shrinking of the brain, and a number of related disorders in language and in movement. Very sad disorder. Beautiful children, but sad disorder. What this scientist in Edinburgh did was he identified the gene that had been done before him, but he created a DNA construct in which he inserted what's known as a stop codon. That is, this, this piece of DNA will prevent this piece of DNA from being read by the genetic machinery of the cell. So it's essentially knocking out that gene. But he did it in a clever way by putting two boundaries here, which are reversible, which by, certain, by adding a certain chemical to the drinking water of the mouse, he could cut that stop codon right out of the genome and turn the gene back on. And then he inserted this whole construct into an embryonic stem cell, planted that in the uterus of a receptive mouse, and bred the mouse into a whole line. And sure enough, these mice grew up with a phenotype that was remarkable. The mouse were obese, they were immobile, they had a number of movement disorders, and they had a very characteristic movement of their forepaws, just like Rhett's girls who constantly wring their hands. And then he gave that substance in the drinking water, cut out the piece of stop DNA, and within four weeks, the animal, to gross observation, was absolutely normal. I do have a movie of that. Uh, I'm a little bit reluctant uh, to take time and show it to you. Uh, this is a, if we have time later, perhaps we'll come back to it. This is a slide of the... It, it doesn't show to an advantage of the red mouse. This is an obese, overweight mouse who didn't move for the length of the movie. This is the same mouse four weeks later who's darting around the cage, has lost all that weight, and is really quite strikingly different. So my feeling is what this points out is that even a genetic change that operates through development and has allowed the nervous system to form under that genetic constraint can be reversed 
in adulthood. And I find that, and I think many people find that, an extremely hopeful sign. And it certainly motivated a lot of what we do. I want to end with a story about, from Leo Zillard about DNA. I've learned a lot about DNA, more than I thought I would ever know. Remember Leo's, and it talks about the origin of where does DNA come from. Um, DNA is an incredibly complex molecule. And Francis Crick, in the foreword of his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, said, where can DNA come from? It's too complex, perhaps, to have arrived by evolution, even over five billion years. Maybe it came from outer space. And he developed a theory of directed panspermia. Someone put DNA in a capsule and sent it to Earth. This is an issue for Talmudic scholars to debate. And Zillard, Leo Zillard, a Hungarian Jew who you may remember, wrote the letter that Albert Einstein signed uh, to President Roosevelt to urge him on to create a nuclear weapon to defend us against the, uh, the Germans who were building a weapon at the same time. Leo Zillard, a very eccentric guy, uh, told, Einstein, told uh, Crick, well, it did come from out of space. And Crick said, well, if it came from out of space, there must be intelligent life out there. Why haven't we heard from them? And the Hungarian Szilard said, we have heard from them. They're living among us. They're called Hungarians. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's going to take the Hungarians to help us solve this mystery of autism and to understand not only the evolution of DNA, but how DNA can be manipulated. So, Ruth, you want to finish?